Today's economy looks very different than the economy where today's decision makers grew up with. Uh, and that's because during the last 50 years, let's say the second half of the last century, right, uh, the economy pretty much looked the same for, for a very long time. Lots of textbooks have been written in that. Jules, uh, school systems have been set up with that. So if you look at the most valuable uh, Fortune 500 companies from 1955, uh, it's basically industrial giants, uh, natural resource producer, um, like oil, for example, uh, food. Food was still valuable back then in the 50s, right? And then in 2005, if you go 50 years forward, it's kind of like the same natural resources, banks. Um, the first computing company went in there, IBM, that was in 2005. But basically the story was, right, the industrial giants give us employment. We fight wars over uh, over over natural resources, over petroleum, uh, most of the time, and the banks are the owners of everything and have a lot of influence. Now that has changed quite dramatically since then. So if you look uh, at at a more recent year, uh, the five by far the five most valuable companies. What they basically do is uh, they study human behavior and convert that into economic value. Let me say that again. Uh, the, the, the big part of the business model is to study human behavior, human behavior, and convert that into economic value. And that is more valuable than petroleum. They have more cash in their pocket than, than banks. Right? They rule the economy, basically. Um, and uh, and if you look at, well, some of them also have some other side business. Apple does some hardware and so forth. Uh, but basically, they all characterize, characterize themselves as artificial intelligence companies, which is based on that data, right? So they take the data and then study it. And most of the data is, is your behavior. Uh, and if you think about the last few years, and I could show you other years here, uh, I mean, not a lot have changed. Basically, uh, the most exciting thing here is that a few of them uh, changed place. But if you you can go to the Fortune 500 most valuable companies right now and look what's the current standing. And these uh, big companies, these digital companies uh, are, are ruling, uh, let's say, at least our times right now. Uh, so the core business model, one way to think about it is as prediction machines. So I say they basically observe the digital footprint that you leave behind, a core part of the business model is that. And then they model human behavior. They start to understand patterns. They use uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, basically for that. And then they make predictions. And predictions is what gives them this economic value. Have a look at this short video here. So let's look at some of the examples of prediction machines in terms of our framework. Well, the infrastructure itself, the hardware, already gives me a lot of predictive power because oh, your mobile phone, it's a hardware that basically moves around and it has a sensor to it, uh, several sensors to it. One important sensor is voice because you try to you talk with your phone, right? It has a voice sensor then. So we know for many years already, uh, since, since Edward Snowden at least revealed part of the uh, data that is collected by the United States government, especially the NSA and other three-letter agencies, that, for example, it's easy to, to identify where you are based on voice. So, so this here is basically a sensor, right? It, it, it's, it's necessary for you to, to transmit voice through, through this sensor when you talk on the phone. Um, and I also know the location because I know where it is. And then you can basically, if you listen to the voice, machine learning can understand what your voice is and therefore locate, locate where you are. And you don't necessarily have to speak into it. You can just sit in a cafe, for example, and talk to somebody, but there is a cell phone close by capturing your voice, and then I can identify where you are. It goes into big databases that has, has people categorized by voice, right? That has been uh, evolved over the last year or decade since Edward Snowden uh, has revealed that. So for example, um, in China, voice biometric collection uh, is, is becoming a, a normal thing as well, not only in the United States, but in other big countries as well. And in this report, for example, it says that it can automatically 
pick up from a massive amount of audio information, audio clips that appear repeatedly. And that is very important, they say, in information security and in monitoring public opinion. All right, so there you go, right? Capturing your voice, seeing what you're saying, and monitoring public opinion. For what? Well, uh, feel free to, 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 to imagine it yourself, how that can be used for the good and for the bad. The technology itself is not deterministic. Right? Another thing is that you necessarily always leave your location behind because this phone, at the very least, has to connect to several radio bases. And if it connects to three radio bases, I can use basic geometry, right? Triangulate the location of where the phone actually is. With a radio bases that works to a certain degree of accuracy, you know, maybe a few a hundred meters or a hundred feet, and then I can say more or less you are here, you're in the vicinity of this parking lot or, or this building. But it also has more, more detailed sensors, GPS, for example, and or Bluetooth, which controlled by these hardware companies, which is basically Apple and Google, right? They control the hardware. And then they can see with the Bluetooth that are constantly sending out different signals of where are you in which vicinity of what other hardware you are that sends around signal. So they're collecting that and especially also with the GPS. So if you have GPS on end or Wi-Fi, which is also used to have your location, I can pretty much pin down your location uh, quite, quite accurately. So here in one study of the New York Times, they found that a senior defense uh, department official and his wife they went to a protest. So they work in the Defense Department and afterwards they went to a protest. Now, is that delicate or not? Well, you can think about it yourself, right? Political campaigns also know where you have been, so if you participate in a protest or not, because they're basically tracking your phone. So there's a bunch, there's an entire industry now that, that has built around that with all of these companies here that you probably never heard of and don't know where and what they are, but they know exactly where and what you are, right? they make a big business out of location data. And location data um, is very unique uh, to cite w one of these officials here. So DNA is probably the only thing that's harder to anonymize than precise geolocation information. Because, you know, as the old song goes, nobody moves like you. And it's true, like nobody, nobody moves like you. Not only in the dance floor, like it, really, like nobody moves like you. <laughs> so if I know how you move, I know exactly also who you are. And I can say like, well, that's anonymous, but it's, it's impossible to anonymize DNA too. And it's pretty impossible to anonymize with a few, with a handful of variables that I have. I can reverse engineer this anonymization and, and get to your personality, to, 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 to identify you as a person. So, so that's hardware already that's tracking us. And that's only the hardware, as I say, the two big um, uh, providers here, especially in the Western world, are, are Google, um, are Google and, uh, and, and Apple that provide especially the geolocation hardware. Uh, you can also do that with software, right? You can, you can track a lot with software as well, especially if you give permission to the geolocation. So let's go to the software. Let's look into the generic services, what you do on base of this hardware, uh, basically. And that has to do a lot with data. So let's look at Facebook. Um, if you have likes in Facebook, I can collect these likes. And then I can train a machine to see if I can detect your personality, if I also know your personality. It turns out that with 10 of your likes, the machine can predict your personality better than your co-workers or co-students that you have. And you know the personalities of your peers in, in your class and so forth, right? You don't know them very well, but that's only with 10 likes, right? Uh, with 70 or 80 likes, it can um, predict your personality as accurately as your friends or, or collaborators. With about 120 likes, it gets it really is at the level of accuracy that we usually would have in a test. Now, if it goes higher with 200 likes, it can predict your personality better than your mother supposedly knows you pretty well, right? Or any other family member or your spouse, right? Long-term partner, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, husband, wife, right? So they, with 200 likes, can be better than that. And then what they also did is like, they ask you, like, you know yourself, right? What is, what is about your personality? And you know yourself, you know you're extrovert, introvert, and so forth, you know, you're, but with about 250, 300 likes, the machine was better than you, yourself. 
in identifying your personality, right? And the personality, these are old tests that we actually use to detect personalities. You just fill out these surveys that you do when you apply to a job, right? And, and you fill out and then the survey tells you how much extrovert and introvert actually you are. And the machine, just by your Facebook likes, is able to reverse engineer that assessment of your personality. Now, not only with your Facebook life, it's enough to see how you move your mouse cursor or how you open and close windows or how you open and close windows here uh, on your phone. Right? Just with the temporal activity, I can with 80% accuracy predict um, if you're open, the level of openness, it's a very important uh, personality trait, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism, conscientiousness. So these are very important personality traits. And I don't even worry about what exactly you're reading. I don't need to know and read the article in order to make an inference of what you like. Just, it's just a temporal activity, how you open and close windows and so forth. And I can use that. That's the digital footprint that you leave behind inevitably with every digital step you take in order to reverse engineer that. Now, we can also do other things that are actually, you know, quite scary. So, for example, if we look somebody in the face, uh, our intelligence is able to make an educated guess about the sexual orientation. So if we would assume that there are two sexual orientation, homosexual, uh, or, uh, homosexual or heterosexual, right, you look somebody in the face and you can kind of like better than chance predict their sexual orientation. So this is known in the social sciences for a long time. For men with 61% accuracy and for women with 54% uh, accuracy. So now that's not too good. I mean, 50-50 is the baseline. If I say you're a homosexual or heterosexual, then 50-50 is the baseline. Looking at a, at a picture of a woman's face, right, you're slightly off both baseline, but very consistently. So we know that humans can do, I mean, some, some people really want you to know that they're homosexual, right? So that it's easier and that gives you a little uh, edge up in the average of the statistics. Um, but the baseline with only two differentiation is 50-50. Of course, there are many more uh, sexual orientations. If you want, please go to Facebook and look in your gender settings. Yeah, go, go into your Facebook account, go to the privacy settings and see how many different privacy settings there are, uh, how many different um, uh, sexual orientations or gender uh, choices you have in Facebook. It's definitely more than two. Please go ahead and have a look. All right, so let's assume there are only two and we can say like with 50, a little bit better than 50-50. Now, if I know the machine, right, and I, and I have a machine and many people in Facebook also tell me their sexual orientation, then I can basically train the machine. That's the idea of machine learning. I say, well, this is what a face looks like. It's a, a person that says is homosexual. That's what a face that looks like of a person that's heterosexual. And I do that for 10 million cases or even more and I train the machine. What do you think the accuracy is that a machine can get to when estimating your sexual orientation just by having five pictures of your face on Facebook? 91% for men, 83% for women. Well, that is actually quite, what, what a scandal, right? What a scandal. Just from a face, how does the machine do that, right? Now, well, the good thing is now we can also look at how the machine does that, right? We cannot open a, a human brain, and we couldn't. We knew that for a long time, that somehow it's possible, somehow it's possible from a face to see uh, sexual orientation, but we didn't know exactly how that was. Because then we cannot open a brain and, like, look into what a brain is doing, what it's doing, when it's doing what it's doing, right? It's very difficult, a little bit delicate. But we can open the silicon brain and basically see what these machines are doing. And it turns out that these machines are focusing on different parts, um, different parts of the, of, of, the, of the face, right? For example, here on the nose part and on this part here on the jaw part and and then these you know computer scientists social scientists computational social scientists that that did the study didn't know really what to do with that so they asked some some biologists um, and medical doctors and they said yes these are exactly the parts of the brain uh, the parts of the face sorry these are exactly the parts of the face that are highly influenced by your hormonal balance so, for example, if you undergo hormone therapy and you take hormones for 13 months in order to change, change your sex, right, uh, because gender-wise you identify rather with the other sex, then during this 13 months also these parts, these little parts of the brain basically, uh, the little parts of the face uh, basically change. And that's what the AI uh, picked up. It just looked at the faces and realized there are small differences that are reflection of our face and our internal hormone, uh, hormone balance. Two or three things to take from that. Living in a world where 
some dozen countries still have the death penalty for homosexuality, that is a bomb. Uh, and talking about technological determinism or social construction, right? the question is here, what are we going to do? Are you going to put the genie back into the bottle? Well, you know, this machine, the machines are just so intelligent. They just look you in the face and know that. Now, you can say like, well, you're not allowed to be so intelligent. The machine doesn't really care so much, right? Uh, at one point, I presented this in a big conference in Latin America. Um, it's kind of like a TED Talk conference with 7,000 people watching there in live. And, and the organizer looked through my slides before and, and, and said, like, you know what, this slide, I, I think you should take it out. And I'm like, why? And she's like, you know what, you know what, here in, you know, in our region, like people get uncomfortable with this kind of stuff. You know what, I also get uncomfortable with this kind of stuff. But you know what, artificial intelligence does not really care about if our, if our little human feelings get like uncomfortable with the power of its intelligence. It just can do what it does. And now we have to socially construct also around to see if, if we use this bomb, or we don't use this bomb and for what we use it, right? Technology is just a tool, but, but that's the power. Um, so, so, so that's very important uh, here to remember. So, that, and that the artificial intelligence has power that goes, goes beyond that. For example, you're free to look uh, at this TED talk here, where it basically shows that the poker face doesn't work anymore. It works still for humans. We can still play poker and entertain each other with playing poker because I'm kind of like, you don't know if I'm fooling you, if I'm lying. But for artificial intelligence, it can basically also see already like the capillaries in your skin and see if you're lying or not. Right, so or the heat sensors and so forth, uh, and and so for for artificial intelligence, there is no poker face anymore. Right, there's very little secrets. Now the artificial intelligence is also so powerful because we leave a lot of data for it to study. Right, so while our life has been migrating towards the digital reality, we always leave this digital footprint behind once we are walking and, and acting in this digital reality. So here you can see that around the world, people use uh, only on social media, the spend time spender I already mentioned before, between, between two and three hours. Uh, and, and it's interesting that actually in developing nations, that average is higher than, than, than in, more, in more developed nations. So like two or three hours being connected actively, not like you're not all the time concentrated here on your so favorite social media account, but you're going back and forth, you're connected on and off and, and, and leave some interaction. Right? Now, this is not only when you're on social media. So for example, maybe you don't have a Facebook account, right? Or you don't post a lot on Facebook because you don't actually, you know, you don't want to leave so much digital footprint behind. Um, do you think that matters? Well, if you look at Facebook, and that's from AC, actually from Facebook's webpage, right? Then they say, when you visit a site or app that uses our services, we receive information even if you're locked out or even if you don't have a Facebook account. This is because other apps and sites don't know who is using Facebook. But they might be using Facebook's services. What does that mean? It might be a company that says, like us on Facebook might be a government and so forth. And I invite you now, right now, to something. Go to your mobile phone right there. Um, you can leave that, that, that screen open here as well. Please don't leave the lecture. <laughs> Go to your email account on your mobile phone or on your computer. Go to your email account and just put in the search bar the word Facebook. That's all. And see what emails come up. What kind of emails come up that are not from Facebook? but are in your email inbox can be your work, your study, or your private email, uh, and that appear when you just put the word Facebook in the search bar. Well, that's quite a lot of, uh, of emails, right? And they, they, these are all some, some part of them who use the services of Facebook. And so Facebook is tracking you anyways because they want to, even if you wouldn't have a Facebook account, right? These are the famous shadow profiles. So what, you actually, what, what a Facebook profile is, the majority is, is shadow profile. The, the, post, the, the image that you post or the post that you make on Facebook, that's just you know, the cherry on top of the cake. The cake is basically actually every digital step you take. Right? So the first time and a few years ago, Mark Zuckerberg was invited to Congress in order to testify about that. 
And the members of Congress didn't do a really good job in, in, in actually questioning him about this issue of shadow profiles because he, already, he always said that you are the owner of your data and you can. You can solicit from Facebook what data does Facebook have uh, and it will take two or three days and they will give you the data that you posted on Facebook. They don't give you the shadow profile data which they collect through other means, right? Basically that you just, even if you're locked out and even if you don't have a Facebook. And at the time when Mark Zuckerberg was testifying in Congress, I was working at the Library of Congress as, as their expert on, on big data. And uh, so while he was there on Capitol Hill, it was a big, it was a big show. And, you know, I was on the Library of Congress, more like on the side of, of Congress trying to understand what's going on. So while he was talking and saying like, you own your data, right? I just out of out of some kind of mood i then started to google i don't have a facebook account and would like to request all personal data stored by facebook so i just google that and see what comes up and i kid you not there was a help page from facebook exactly with the title i don't have a facebook account and would like to request all personal data stored by facebook <laughs> now that page disappeared the day after, but I took a screenshot that you can see here. And there are three steps outlined what you can do if you don't have a Facebook account, but you want to know the shadow profile. Step number one, create a Facebook account. <laughs> and then, you know, so you won't get to that. But I'm saying this data that is collected, the data is collected by, by, by media companies, especially Google and Facebook, who 100% depend on studying your behavioral data. And because their income is by marketing, right? They don't really have a subscription. Amazon, Apple has other sources of income as well. They don't, right? So they kind of like track you all around the clock. And this can also be, uh, this can be seen. You can, for example, in your browser, install uh, an observer. Server. And if you just go to different web pages, what I did here is I went to different newspaper web pages, right? So the Huffington Post, Fox News, The Guardian, and BBC. And you can see when I start that, there are already like, like 60 trackers coming on this website and kind of like tracking my behavior. And that was with my privacy blocker on. <laughs> now, if I turn the privacy blocker off and I'm just on these four websites, uh, news websites, you can see how many trackers actually come and observe my behavior of how I read through these websites. Right? So here they are quickly, in, in a few minutes, there's over 300 trackers and you can see where they're from. Secure US, Amazon, Google, and so forth. And they just basically track my behavior here by reading news websites. So what is it the business really you might think of a security company or of Amazon, of Google and of whatever other company to, to understand what I'm doing when I'm reading my newspaper website, right? So you're free to use that as well and see, and, and see how quickly that's going. So uh, what, we, what I'm uh, saying here is basically the technological infrastructure, be it hardware and or being software, gives us a lot of data. And that's what these companies that right now by far are the most valuable companies on planet Earth use in order to study mainly also human behavior. And that allows them to make predictions, predictions about your behavior. And that's where this economic value comes from. So it's there's still economic value in, you know, good old, indu good old industrial eco economics. There's still economic value in driving a taxi around transport, right? But what actually companies like Uber and so forth do is they basically an information platform that intermediates there. They collect data. They can make predictions and they intermediate between there. Same what Amazon is doing. There is still value in producing goods and selling goods. Um, but Amazon, what it's doing, it's basically intermediating the information and reducing its inventory. So instead of Amazon buying all these products and putting them in a warehouse, they make predictions and they might send that product to you even before you thought about buying it, they might send it close to you. So not storing it there, their predictions are so good. Well, it's pretty easy. You know, if you, if you buy diapers every other week, so it's very likely that in two weeks you will need diapers again, right? That's because you're probably a young parent. So they start sending the diapers close to you when you're about to make that click and don't store it in the warehouse. Then their predictions are much more sophisticated with that. And with that, they reduce the inventory and that's their economic aggregate value. It's the predictions where this economic aggregate value actually comes from.